Well, hello and good afternoon. My name is Karen Goodfriend and I am an independent curator and I'm talking today with Sawyer Rose, who is one of the uh, 28 artists in Agency Feminist Art and Power. This exhibition is at the Museum of Sonoma County in Santa Rosa and just so pleased to be working with you, Sawyer, and we're going to be talking all about your work. But a little bit about the show, we have a multi-generational intersectional group of artists from Joan Semmel and Judy Chicago to some artists that are fresh out of college. And it's all about agency. And so if you are in the area, I really hope that you'll come and see it. And if not, check us out online. But hey, so let me introduce Sawyer. So Sawyer Rose is a sculptor and this is exciting news. You were just accepted as a member of the Royal Society of, uh, of Sculpture, Sculpture Artists in London. And so the, I heard the society was um, created to champion, it's over 100 years old, and to champion artists, uh, sculptors such as yourself. So tell us about that. I was really excited um, to be accepted, certainly. Um, I'm looking forward to traveling to London to meet everybody. They have this great big house in the middle of London. Um, but right now everything's on Zoom, which is actually kind of exciting because I've been able to connect with sculptors all over the world, um, you know, in the past few weeks since I've been a member. And um, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's a real honor and it's a real, it's very exciting to connect with, you know, these amazing people doing amazing work. Yeah, well, congratulations. I think Thank it's you. just so exciting. Tell us a little bit about Amira, your piece in the show, and then we'll jump into why it's important. Okay, sure. So um, the sculpture and the portrait that we see behind you um, are the two parts of the Amira sculpture uh, or the Amira piece. Uh, the sculpture is a data visualization of her paid and unpaid work hours. And what I do with this project, the Carrying Stones project that I've been working on for, you know, five, six, seven years now is um, I get participants like Amira who have really interesting work lives. And I ask them to collect their data for me, paid and unpaid work hours. And then once I make a data visualization of her work hours, I take it back to her and I take a portrait of her lifting and carrying the burden of her women's labor. Um, so, so that's the two parts and that's how I kind of combine data and art and storytelling to, you know, really, um, give a poignant retelling of what this particular woman does with her time. Oh, that's fascinating. And tell, how many pieces have you done to date? I have done 12 large scale sculptures. They're all, you know, as big as the one behind you, you know, 10, 12, 15 10. feet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, and a series of 2D works that are also based on data about women's labor and equity. Um, so, you know, it's probably about 25 works total in the project so far, and it's ongoing. Yeah, I just love this Carrying Stones project. Well, tell us about uh, how you collect the data, like what you, you tell the, the people that you're working with. Um, that's a great question. So, um, the logistics of collecting the data, uh, I developed an app that participants could use just on their phone or on their laptop because these are all extremely busy working women. I wanted to make it as easy as possible. Um, so they can record for about two weeks, three weeks time, uh, every hour of every day, whether they spend it on paid labor, unpaid labor or anything else, or if they're asleep during that time. And, um, what I tell them when they're collecting their data, uh, we have an interview beforehand and an interview after, and we really look at, um, you know, how, you know, it, not everything fits cleanly in a bucket of it's paid, it's unpaid, and sometimes, you know, you're doing two things at once, um, but there's also mental labor, emotional labor that a lot of women put a lot of time into. So we really talk through that and try to decide, um, you know, what, um, what category to place everything in. So I know with your, with your work, such as the, you know, the, your sculpture in the show behind me, there's two different elements. There's one that represents the 
paid labor and also unpaid labor. Would you talk a little bit more about what that actually is and what that means for women, the paid and unpaid? Sure. So in this particular piece, the black solid forms represent Amira's paid labor hours, one object per hour. Um, and there are wireframes uh, that represent one hour each of her unpaid labor. Um, and the reason I make that distinction is because in our society, uh, paid labor tends to be a lot more recognized, given a lot more status. And so I make that the solid object, whereas unpaid labor, which statistically falls mostly to women, is typically underrecognized, underpaid or unpaid. So I make that transparent to represent the difference in um, awareness, recognition, you know, the space that people give to that work. So I know the Caring Stones project started, or at least conceptually for you, when you had an infant and a toddler. And so can you tell us about you know, how this paid and unpaid labor really affects women in society? Yeah, so the thing is, um, domestic labor, cooking, cleaning, caring for either children or elders, um, and even community volunteerism which I consider caretaking of the larger community, all of those things, not just in our country, but in every country in the world, fall statistically mostly on women. And what happens is, you know, when women are spending all this time um, on unpaid labor, they're not able to make uh, advances in their careers and in society. So um, it's really important to... Um, it's really important to balance the playing field because it really it benefits everybody, not just benefits the women when we get women into the workforce or doing, you know, paid labor, advancing in their careers. It is better in the workplace. It's better for productivity. It's better for innovation. It's better for worker retention because it makes for happier workplaces. In the home, a balanced workload of domestic labor benefits the whole family, better relationship with your partner, better relationship with your children or, you know, your mother or father you're taking care of. So it really, you know, while we're talking about women's labor, it really is something that affects everybody and improving it will improve the situation for everybody. Yeah, that was actually my first question on how does it affect people around us? Um, but I know you've done such massive research. Tell us about the GDP, like if women's unpaid labor was actually recognized, what that what that really means for the economy? Yeah, so when, when I was starting this project, the, the statistic that really caught my attention was that in the United States, if you added up all of women's unpaid domestic labor, it would be something around 25% of the GDP. Which, I, which is just shocking. And I know the New York Times came out with a figure and I can't remember if it was our country or worldwide, but it was something like $10 billion worth of unpaid labor that women are doing. Um, you know, because certainly men do unpaid labor as well, but the women's share is just, it's massive. And, um, you know, statistically much more massive than the men's share. So, um, you know, that's- um, it, It's a big it's, number. It's a big number. <laughs> I was having trouble communicating the size of the issue of, you know, women's labor inequity. I was having trouble explaining it to my husband and to my friends. And so when I um, communicated that GDP number, um, I felt like it really got traction. I like that really explained it to people. And I thought, okay, well, if I've got this, like, let's find more numbers, let's give people the facts and translating it into art and storytelling is the way that I feel like I can make that um, approachable, absorbable, you know, we're confronted with so much information these days that, um, you know, a large part of my project is making it palatable to try to understand these complicated issues. Yeah, I know. It's like, I love because your work just in and of itself is just absolutely beautiful. But then, you know, when we tell people what it means, it's like, they're just, they're blown away. They're just, you know, because isn't it true women on the average do three hours more of uh, unpaid labor a day than men. Yeah, you know, that was um, before the pandemic and then the pandemic changed everything. Um, 
I would love to be able to be here and tell you that it, even the playing field and everybody realized and appreciated what everybody else did, but it didn't actually turn out that way. Yeah, no, I think actually the pandemic made it much worse for women. And I know a lot of friends of mine that are, you know, academics, it's like they, you know, when you're homeschooling your kids, you don't have time to do research. But oh. um, so I have, yeah, a question. So what um, drew you to the wire structures that you use? And, and I have these questions, so I'm reading this. What about the shape helps you invoke both the data and the emotions associated with the paid and unpaid labor and leisure of women. Sure. So um, in this particular piece, the, um, I always try to ask the woman who's the participant, whose story I'm telling, to tell me all about her life, you know, not even related to her labor, just her likes or dislikes, her favorite color, whatever she can tell me about herself, because I really want to... Um, center not just her and her work story but like you know put some of her personality into it it's not um you know i like to step out of the spotlight as much as possible and put this woman in the spotlight um so in the case of amira um she had these really amazing earrings on which i mean it sounds so random but you know and she told me oh these are my favorite i love these for you know they're bold and they're this and they're um, and she, you know, they were sort of this curved shape and I thought, oh, I can work with that. And she, um, is just like a really sharp dresser. She's always in black leather. And so I thought, okay, so I worked with this faux leather, um, and the particular shape that I chose though. Um, so the way these arrays work as data visualizations is, um, the paid labor hours and unpaid labor hours are represented but um, I leave spaces in between representing the hours where she was doing anything other than working. But in this particular case, Amira, um, at the time when she, when she gave me her data, she was working, you know, paid labor, unpaid labor, you know, multiple volunteer gigs and her socializing and working and volunteering all overlapped all the time. So for hers, I wanted something much more fluid to mm -hmm. express what she was telling me, not the quantitative, but the qualitative of her story. And so that's why it sort of looks like a wave. And that's why the pieces are sort of these, um, you know, curved, they're flowing one into the another into another, because that's like the lived reality of the life behind her data. Yeah, no, that's... That's fascinating. Hey, so how did the women that you worked with, how, how did um, they, you know, were the people that you gathered the data from, what was their reaction? What's the gen been the general reaction when they see the piece realized? <laughs> um, luckily, everybody's been very excited. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> been disappointed. Um, you know, the data collection process and the, you know, digging into the women's stories has been really uh, emotional for some of the women. So, um, so also to like see, you know, sort of this like fruit of their labor writ large on a wall, taking up space unapologetically, um, has been very emotional for some of the participants, mm -hmm. um, which has really, you know, it's really hit home with me. You know, I feel like I'm hopefully, you know, doing what I can to spread the message, but also doing what I can for these particular people who are, giving me a little bit of their precious time to help study this larger issue. Right, yeah, that's sort of what um, I meant because I know like all your works are just so gorgeous, but it's like, I can just imagine when, you know, cause I actually did the project for you. I mean, you know, just for fun and to see like how many hours are just unpaid. So more like, you know, just seeing their reaction, I'm sure, you know, when they're standing in front of it and realize it's like, wow, that's a, a heavy stone to have to carry it is, and you know <laughs> yeah yeah I'm and I think you know for for some of the participants it's been an experience to see themselves recognized for something that they have you know in some cases never in their whole life been recognized for mm -hmm. so um just to you know like hold space for them and give them the recognition it's you know maybe it's like you know cleaning houses isn't 
something that they've been recognized for, but I feel like it's, you know, that's some of the work that holds up our entire society. It's hard work. It's honest work. It should be recognized. It should be, mm-hmm. you know, large and in a museum for everybody to see. And I'm glad that it is. <laughs> well, thank you for putting it there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, back to like the pandemic, two years into the pandemic, what do you think has changed in society's perception of work uh, for paid and unpaid? Do you think the needle has moved at all? I think the needle has moved backward, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) I wish I were here with better news. So, you know, as you were saying, you know, women were already doing more unpaid, especially domestic labor than men before the pandemic, a significant amount more. Um, But then during the pandemic, you know, when we were sort of in the real thick of things and everybody was home and like under, you know, shelter in place orders, um, women were doing 65 hours per week of unpaid labor on top of whatever paid job they were still doing remotely. Um, and that was 31% more than the men were doing at the time. So it's, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's like men went up a little bit and women went up a huge amount. And, um, so you know, during that time, one in four women, it's like 25% of women had to either scale back their careers or leave their careers. And then, you know, with low income women, so there's a laundry list of things that happened, low income women, yeah. and especially women with caretaking responsibilities um, were hit particularly hard. So like disproportionately even worse. Um, and they were three times as likely to have to leave their jobs. Um, because, you know, it's like, if you didn't have the resources to pay somebody privately, there was, and there was no caretaking facilities for, you know, children or elders, um, Mm -hmm. you know, there was nothing you could do, but quit your job. And so now today men have officially, as of a couple months ago, fully recouped all their labor force losses. So that means like as many men are employed now as were, you know, before the start of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but now there are over 1 million fewer women in the workforce than before the pandemic. So that's a big gap that still needs to be filled. And that's, that's that's astonishing. It is. Yeah. Um, So it really, so your work so much ties in with the whole like theme of agency and how um, so many of the works are about uh, gender expectations, gender roles and gender expectations, because it's still, it's so surprising. Here we are 2022 and, you know, we're all still just stuck in the kitchen cooking or cleaning or, you know, whatever. It's like, how has this happened? And um, yeah, I mean, this could, this would be a very deep subject that we could go off for an hour, but just wondering, I mean, I wonder what could we do to change that? I mean, actually, I know that you're, you've been working with legislators to, you know, to bring this information to them. Can you tell us about that, about working with um, people to actually, you know, help change laws in order to make, you know, um, yeah, tell us about that. What yeah, so, been doing um, I've, I've worked with the National Women's Law Center, um, you know, on an informal basis. I don't want to, you know, mm-hmm. um, overstate my involvement, but um, I am a big supporter of theirs and um, have been in talks with them about this project. Um, They do some really important work. Uh, There's a lot of people doing a lot of really important work, but if you go to their website, you can find a really good list of things that would help, you know, um, subsidized childcare would really help, especially low wage workers. Um, revising the way that part-time work is compensated and structured would really help, you know, these on-call shifts and no benefits. And that would really help women balance their domestic responsibilities. I mean, certainly the long, the short of it is men and women need to do a better job balancing them together. Um, And on a, a personal, you know, project level, something I do to try to move the needle. Um, it, I have a few interactive events and sculptures that invite everyone, all visitors to the show, to look at their own data, to participate in either co-creating a sculpture or in an event where they can, you know, just, um, 
you know, make a on the fly data sculpture of their own labor hours. And I think that's really important to get people, you know, so the project focuses on women, but get men, women, and all genders involved in looking at their own data. And sometimes more importantly, their partner's data to, to really see what everybody's doing and have a personal awareness of where we all stand on the uneven playing field. Right. It is very uneven. So I have uh, one last question, and I know that um, your show is going to University of North Carolina and that you're booking out um, to have the Curian Stones Project travel around the country through late 2026. And so tell us, you know, a, a little bit, you know, about that and, and more so like, I know you do so much programming. Tell us like what the show will offer. Yeah, so... Show as in programming. Yeah, you know, it's it's really exciting that the show is traveling because it gives me an opportunity to do so much more than just show the art. So yeah, at the University of North Carolina, for example, I'm going to be delivering the Frank Porter Graham annual lecture to Honors Carolina, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm from North Carolina originally, so it'll be like coming back home for me. Um, and, you know, they're keeping me for a week and I'm going to do interactive events and talks and I'm going to lecture classes and I'm going to train their museum docents. Um, and so it's really exciting because spreading the word about women's labor justice is the whole goal of the project. So the more I can, you know, get in and talk to people face to face and explain what I'm doing, I feel like the more powerful it is. So um so yeah, so that's just one example, um, but it's going to be traveling around the country doing similar things um, and, you know, hopefully just um, getting in front of eyes and uh, having people really understand the, the breadth of the situation. Right. Well, um, so then lastly, is there anything else I haven't asked you about that you'd like to tell us? Um, you know, I could talk for hours, but <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, I will just stress again that, you know, labor inequity and, and workplace justice is not just something that affects only women. It affects everybody. Um, and, you know, if I think it's also important to start early with kids, if you, if you have kids, if you you know, have kids in your life that you talk to on a regular basis, you know, set an example of balanced uh, gender roles in terms of labor. And, um, you know, I know the kids are going to be all right. They're doing great. Um, but I think, you know, the more that we spread the message and the earlier that we spread the message, um, the better outcomes we'll have in the next generation. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And thanks for spending uh, some time with me this afternoon. It has been and my pleasure. Who's next? Thank you for having me. I've really, um, I always enjoy working with you and it's always a pleasure to talk. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.